we have our CBSN political reporter, Caitlin Huey Burns, who's been listening to this whole thing alongside a political a reporter, Grace Seegers. Both of you guys are, are, are here hanging out. So I guess, you know, Caitlin, um, I'll just pivot to you to start off with, um, you listened to everything that they had to say. It actually was quite an emotional uh, press briefing, kind of your biggest takeaway. An emotional press briefing indeed, especially comments from uh, Congressman Clyburn. Um, and what you're hearing from those lawmakers is a, a couple of different things. One, uh, now is the time, given the protests that we're seeing around the country, not just in big cities, but in small towns and suburbs, uh, really everywhere across the country, public sentiment uh, against uh, racial injustice is, is very high. Um, and you also heard from them um, kind of how uh, the, the, the opportunities, but also the challenges in going forward with this legislation. Um, this is a comprehensive set of bills to address police violence and accountability. Uh, that is kind of the, the focus of these uh, pieces of legislation, and uh, Chairwoman Bath said that there are other issues, certainly, that need to be addressed as well. Uh, but they also spoke to the challenges of, of getting this through the finish line with a Republican Senate. And I think that's important to pick up on. Uh, Kamala Harris, in, in those remarks, noted that just last week, uh, they were debating an anti-lynching bill. That, in and of itself, is still having trouble passing the Senate. And so the challenges are very high, um, but this is a moment that they are seizing uh, as they are hearing the outcry from the public. Uh, another thing to watch, and you heard uh, some of the members talk about it, is this uh, push to defund the police has become something of a rallying cry. You heard in that discussion during the press conference that there is a lot of nuance to that discussion. Uh, many members say that they need to reform uh, the police police, you know, you look at police budgets that have increased, uh, whether those resources can be diverted to other programs, that's kind of at the heart of this discussion. Um, in Los Angeles, for example, um, Mayor Garcetti had increased the police budget and uh, in the past couple of days has now slashed that budget in response to this. So that's kind of one way to go about it. However, you're already seeing President Trump and Republicans try to seize on that theme and try to make a wedge uh, heading into this election. So Grace, you know, as Caitlin points out, uh, you heard powerful words from these lawmakers, including Kamala Harris, but I was also struck by Hakeem Jeffries, who sort of dropped the history lesson on uh, the United States and the people watching, uh, talking about the arrival of African Americans in this country in 1619 in shackles and in chains, being here before there even was a country, building the country up, and all African Americans have ever wanted was to be treated equally, not better, not worse, just equally is what Congressman Jeffrey said. So explain how this 136-page police reform bill would potentially do that, would right the wrongs that have existed for so many years in this country. Yes, so as you mentioned, it's 136 pages, a very long bill, but it has several different measures which attempt to address inequality. An important one is making it easier to prosecute police officers in civil court, making it easier for people to pursue damages in case their constitutional rights are violated by a police officer. You also see a creation of a national police misconduct registry, which would take down whenever there is a case of police misconduct and therefore make it more difficult for a police officer who conducts him or herself poorly to then move on to a different precinct if they commit misconduct. You also see some things that respond directly to what has been happening recently with the ban of no-knock warrants on, in the case of drug cases. We saw recently Breonna Taylor was killed in her own home after police officers entered her house with a no-knock warrant. There would also be a federal ban on chokeholds responding to George Floyd's death, who died after he was pinned down with a knee to his neck for nearly nine minutes. So there's a lot of 
provisions in this bill which respond directly to what protesters have been calling for, while also attempting to work on decades of inequality. So, Caitlin, we heard, you know, some of the lawmakers appealing to Mitch McConnell to um, to to get on board with this. And, um, you know, you heard the mention of, of uh, you know, that they, they couldn't even get a, a lynching bill passed. And, and the idea of even t using the phrase lynching as an issue in 2020 is, you know, I think ridiculous to many, many people. And the fact that something like that, a bill could not be passed, which seems like an old brainer, um, suggests to me that this wide sweeping list of reforms would um, be facing tremendous challenges on Capitol Hill. Yeah, I think that really helps to contextualize the challenges coming ahead. Uh, even if uh, this bill is able to pass through the House uh, with a Democratic majority, it does face likely some opposition in the Senate, especially because you have the president leading uh, with uh, a very, very different narrative. Uh, and the, the Senate Judiciary Committee, which is chaired by Lindsey Graham, an ally of the president, has announced that next week they will uh, look into the issue of police reform. He talked in a hearing last week saying uh, that there are a lot of questions uh, that they need to build upon some reforms made in the Obama administration uh, and that they need to look at specifically why police who have many complaints against them are allowed to stay in the force. However, when you look at what the Trump administration has done to unravel some of those reforms in the Obama administration, limiting uh, consent decrees, for example, uh, limiting the power of the Justice Department to investigate cases as another example. Example. Uh, those are things that this administration has taken uh, under its um, Justice Department uh, that are at odds with what uh, these Democrats are talking about. So uh, that's what we have to really look into or watch for as Republicans start to talk about this. Um, uh, Rand Paul has supported a bill, for example, uh, with Congressman Schatz from uh, Hawaii, a Democrat, to uh, limit the, the militarization of the police force by limiting uh, the transfer of, of military-style um, equipment to police officers. But just last week, you saw that opposition from Paul against uh, the, the lynching bill saying it was anti-lynching bill saying it was too broad. So there certainly are these challenges. And when you look at the president's messaging, this law and order message, this really seizing on a, a defund the police message, uh, that seems to be where Republicans go. And if you look at this past weekend, you know, Mitt Romney uh, made a lot of headlines for participating in the Black Lives Matter marches in Washington. He's the only one in the Senate uh, on the Republican side that we have seen so far participate in any of those demonstrations. Right. Um, um, let me ask you, Grace, before we wrap this up, um, just briefly, I, I think it's important for our viewers to understand, because as Caitlin points out, the president's messaging on this is very different. He has been tweeting in all caps, uh, Democrats and sleepy Joe Biden want to defund the police. On one tweet over the weekend, he said, I want great and well-paid law enforcement. I want law and order in all caps, basically shouting it. I just think it's important for us to define for our viewers what defunding the police means. The president, in one of these tweets over the weekend, says uh, Democrats want to abolish the police. That is not what defunding the police means. Can you just break it down for us? Right. So the idea of abolish the police, it sounds very similar to the 2018 abolish ICE calls, referring to immigration customs enforcement. But protesters and activists aren't calling for abolishing the police. They're merely pointing out that billions of dollars are sent to police departments each year, and often military-grade equipment, military-grade uh, training and that means that police officers are often uh, kind of trained to think about their jobs in a more militarized way. So defunding the police is really about kind of taking some of that funding away that goes towards militarization of the police, uh, reinvesting it in the community, uh, and also 
improving training. So there are some protesters who call for eliminate, eliminating police departments entirely, but overall the call for defunding the police is really about ensuring that that funding goes from heavy militarization of the police departments to be reinvested in the community. But of course it is difficult to explain and easy to make into a political soundbite. So the president can say, Democrats want to defund the police, and that's a real way for him to rally up his base and for him to say, I'm the president of law and order. And that has some very significant connotations for some people when they hear law and order, when they hear support for law enforcement, they think that the president is going to take a strong stand against protesters and against any violence that comes from looting. But for the people who do not support the president, they hear it kind of as a threat against them and a threat against peaceful protesters. So there's a lot of complexity here in the language that is used. And we're glad, uh, Grace and Caitlin, that you are able to provide that clarity uh, that our viewers so sorely need. As always, we appreciate it, Caitlin and Grace. Thank you. Thank you.